Oh, they got a little bit tired out. They needed to go ahead and, uh, and stop early. Uh, glad you're with us, uh, wherever you're at. Uh, thanks for being here. We are uh, gathering again for another uh, Sunday of worship here. I'm Dennis, the pastor here at Gateway Alliance. Um, and uh, we're, we're thankful that uh, we're able to do this again. Uh, I am going to uh, give a little bit more information about the reopening aspects uh, later on. So I won't do that right now, uh, but later on I'll speak into that a little bit and, uh, and let you know where we're at right now uh, and just kind of where we're, where we're looking at. But we do not have all the pieces in place yet. So uh, it's still a work in progress. Um, but uh, we are familiar probably with this process now, so we're gonna, it's going to look the same. We're going to have music and then a message. And so let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer and, uh, and begin our time together in worship. So join me in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for another day, another opportunity to uh, gather, even in this continued uh, separated way, uh, to be able to worship you. Uh, and so, Lord, we, um, we enter into this as uh, an interruption, in, in a sense, of where uh, normal, normal routines are interrupted this morning uh, to be able to really worship you. And so, uh, focus our minds, focus our attention upon you, and help us as we lift up our voices uh, in our different places. May they all join together in uh, a beautiful harmony that rises to you and brings you glory and honor. So be with us, lead us, and uh, help us uh, help us during this, these few brief moments together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
As I mentioned uh, at the beginning, I want to spend just a couple of moments uh, talking about uh, some of the reopening aspects for us before uh, we get into the sermon for today. So many of you will know that uh, the governor uh, gave word Friday afternoon that churches could begin to reopen and send out guidance for us to be looking through. There's about four pages worth or so of guidance that uh, that was sent out and that we're trying to look through and, and work through. The uh, stay-at-home order was also extended for two weeks, which uh, gets kind of problematic with some of this as well. Uh, but two, of the, two of the biggest pieces of difficulty for us in being able to reopen is that we are supposed to be at 40% capacity and still keep the six feet of distance uh, be between each other. 40% for us is 32 people. However, being able to get 32 people in this room with six feet distance is probably not very realistic. So uh, that's where it gets very difficult for us in dealing with this uh, space that that we have uh, and there's there's a lot of options as many of you know there's many many churches across the country that are doing many different things uh, and there's nothing wrong with it we have to look at specifics for us and what is going to work best for us uh, so there's all kinds of options that are available of course of meeting outside more and so forth however uh, Christy and I had an outdoor wedding and if you've had an outdoor wedding, then you know that for the weeks and the months leading up to you saying, we're going to have an outdoor wedding, you then immediately begin to say, what about the weather? What are we going to do? Right? Uh, we, there is no possible way for us to have a backup plan uh, to say, we're going to do an outdoor service. And then if it rains, we'll just do this and so forth. None of that will work. So there's just so many layers of complication with this. Uh, that make it very difficult. So we are going to move rather slowly. Um, I've been talking with the board already and we have not come to any firm conclusions, but we are going to delay reopening. Uh, so uh, I would not expect us to be back in the building in any sort of larger capacity uh, before Father's Day, which is June 21st. There's a couple reasons for this, uh, and this could change, but in all likelihood, this, this will be the case. Um, but here's the reason for that. One is that it will give us a little bit of time to watch what happens across the state as other churches begin to regather and so forth. If things begin to go badly, then we can just say, well, we're, we'll just stay uh, with online only for a little bit longer until, until all of that gets sorted out. So it will give us, it will give us an opportunity to, to watch what's going on in other parts of the state. And it will also give us a little bit longer time period to try to figure out what will be best for us. Uh, there's some ideas that are out there of um, trying to spread out our, our group uh, a little bit more. Uh, with some of the things that we could offer and so forth. I'm not going to mention any of those ideas now, uh, but in the coming days to weeks or so, we will get that out to you. So as soon as, as, soon as we know, uh, we'll get it to you. I fully understand that um, we, all have, we all have different ideas about what will work best and uh, we all have different ideas about what uh, is even going on with uh, COVID-19 and, and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and so we're all going to have to just be patient with one another and, um, and, and just move uh, cautiously and, and carefully as we try to figure this thing out. I am I'm very anxious uh, for you to be back here. Uh, I'm... I'm I was really wrestling with that this week of where it's so strange for nine years I have been thinking and planning and working to have more people in the building. How can we get more and more people in the building? And now it's like, how do we keep people out of the building? <laughs> it's a very strange kind of shift. And so um, 
You know, there's there's all kinds of different things. One one last thing that I'll mention about this, and then we'll we'll get into the into the sermon. Um, that just kind of talks about how we as as humans interact with each other and these things and so forth. Many of us will probably remember the days before cell phones were all over the place. And uh, in those days, if somebody would sneeze or cough, um, you would just kind of say, bless you or excuse you and, um, and not think anything of it. But in the very beginnings of cell phones really taking over, if a cell phone went off in a meeting or in a church service or something like that, everybody would just glare at the person, right? As they're trying to work through getting their phone turned off and so forth. And all of a sudden, that is going to switch. We're going to regather at some point, and cell phones will go off, and we're like, oh, no big deal. We hear cell phones all the, all the time. But if somebody sneezes or coughs, we're all going to be, <laughs> what, do we, what do we do, right? What's going on? It's, well, this is one of the weird times that we're living in with this, of where all of a sudden, all of that just switches. And so we're, we're going to have to just be ready to, uh, to laugh and uh, to be patient with each other and kind with each other. Um, you're all watching the news. Uh, there's so many, there's a lot of great stories that are going on, but there's so many horrible stories that are going on right now, isn't there? Um, so many sad, sad things. We are under an incredible amount of pressure and you can just feel it beginning to, to spill over and um, we, we want to be different, right? We, we want to set a different tone, uh, than some of the, some of the stories that we're, that we're seeing happen. And so, uh, so thank you for your patience. Uh, and as we, as we get it figured out, we will, we will let you know. And, um, you know, we're, we're looking forward to having, having you back, uh, in, in the building. Uh, let me just pray for us real quick, just to uh, put that behind us as we then move into into the sermon. So uh, join me in prayer, please. Uh, Father, uh, clear our minds of uh, just some of these distractions and um, and difficulties. Help us to really focus in on on your word now and uh, teach us and and lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be looking at three texts today. So if you want to go ahead and start finding them, uh, that would be great. I cheat. I got them marked out so I can get to them pretty quickly. Uh, Luke 12, Psalm 121, and Genesis 22. Those are going to be the three texts that we, um, that we look at today. I recently read, although I can't remember where, and I can't remember the exact quote, but I recently read something that basically said this. Give your house a name and see how you think differently about it. Give your house a name and then see how you think differently about it. Names are really interesting, aren't they? Uh, they, they carry a history. They're bound in stories. Names give us insight and clarity. Throughout scripture, we discover that God has many names. There's many different names which God is known by, and we see those in different places throughout Scripture. And each one points us to something incredible and gives us something to take with us as we travel on the road of faith, uh, to be able to interact with, with God as we go through different things in life. The name to keep in mind as we go through today is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Uh, you're going to hear that multiple times today, and, and then I also hope that you will take this name and you will, you will think on it as, as you go throughout um, your, your days and, and weeks ahead. As usual, and yes, I'm a broken record. I have fully embraced it at this point. I have no shame in being a broken record. We're covering a very small portion of these texts and of what we could cover today. Uh, I, I say this because I, I want it to entice us to, to search more, to dig more, to, to want to know more, to study more uh, on, on our own, and, and to keep, keep yearning after, after God. And the hope is that by just continually laying that out there, of saying, 
there's so much more that we could think through, that we could talk about, that we could that we could work through, is is to say go go and find that, go go and, and find that and, and work with it. Uh, so today I want to start in the New Testament and move backwards into the Old Testament to then move forward into today. Does that make sense? <laughs> Hopefully it will. All right. So we're going to start in Luke 12. So if you have, uh, if you have your Bible, uh, tablet, phone, uh, whatever it is, uh, open it up to Luke 12, and we're going to we're going to read another parable from Jesus to to begin with today. And um, again, backing up and, and reading reading through this will be beneficial. Uh, I had a I had a moment this week where I was working through this and I just laughed. I, I was sitting at the table uh, and I just started laughing at the interaction that we're going to see here because Jesus has been spending his time teaching. He's he's teaching these incredible truths about himself and so forth. And then starting in verse 13, hear this, uh, this question or this, this statement that, that is asked, uh, that is said towards Jesus. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. That's what made me laugh. <laughs> this is, this is astounding. Um, to just think through that, that I, I'm for sure, I'm certain the disciples laughed as well uh, when when this took place, but let's let's keep that in mind as we continue on with this short parable. Someone in the crowd said to a teacher, "Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me." But he said to him, "Man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you?" And he said to them. Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul! You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. We're going to stop there. Uh, this is a short parable. Again, this is, uh, this is a teaching tool. This is allegory. There's... Um, all these different elements that are that are wrapped up in this, but Jesus is using this to um, to try to get a specific point across to to this individual and to the audience that is uh, that was there and that is reading this now. So, do you notice what Jesus is doing in this conversation? This individual approaches Jesus with a very specific mindset and hope. But Jesus begins to redirect him. And we can find this throughout all of Scripture, of where people are approaching God or, or interacting with God, and they'll have an idea in mind, but then, but then God begins to redirect them. And we see Jesus doing this, constantly challenging our way of thinking, forcing us to slow down and to see things Differently, undoubtedly, this this man wanted Jesus to just immediately speak into this and and satisfy this this real quick um, with a real quick answer. But Jesus Jesus slows down and and tells this story. It would have taken time, and then not only do you hear this story, but now you have to think through this story. This this slowing down aspect is. I, I believe a tool used by God to really force us to to think and and to really reckon with uh, what is going on and what what we're what we're wanting and what we're trying to get. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Do we immediately begin to think about possessions? 
That's the question. When you hear the Lord will provide, God is a provider, what do you think about? If, if possessions immediately comes to mind, then that can tell us something about our, our heart or, or our mindset, where, where our thinking is. Uh, and the question is, is that only what God is talking about? And I think what we can see from Scripture is that it is, it is deeper than that. It's more um, nuanced than that. God is trying to get at something more significant than us just attaining more possessions from a provider. The man in the parable had a great harvest and as a result built larger barns to store it all in. Uh, Kosuki Koyama, a Japanese Christian author, notes on this parable that the great harvest, the great increase, put the farmer into a new crisis. So we can think of being in crisis if we do not have a lot of possessions. But Kosuki brings us to this place of thinking through that actually having an addition or plethora of possessions can bring us into crisis as well. And so we see this farmer in crisis. I got all of this stuff. I, what am I going to do with it? And so he builds larger and more barns in order to keep it all in. It's interesting to think through this, though, as crisis, because we could initially just think of, a, of it as, well, this is great. This is good for him that he's going through this. But this is a beauty and the genius of the parable of when you get to the very end of it, you now have to think very differently than what we may originally think when we first interact with it. Uh, and I think, I think Kosuki is, is onto something. I, I can really get this sense of greater possessions brings us into, uh, into a new crisis or a new type of crisis that we have to deal with now. I've struggled with this personally, and I've, I've seen others struggle with it, of where you enter into a phase of life, of where uh, you're looking at a bank account and saying, there's not much there. If only I had more money, everything would be fine. And then at some point in your life, you get more money, and then you're, you're still saying, well, if I only had more money, everything would be fine. It seems to never end, you see. And I think that's the problem of whenever we gain some sort of level, we can then look to that next level and say, well, I'm not there. And it's just this endless cycle of constantly um, feeling relief, but then being unsatisfied. And, and Jesus is really honing in on this in, in, in one aspect, I think, with this parable and interacting with this gentleman uh, that we see from this crowd. The statement from God at the end of the parable is, of course, extremely important. This night, your soul is required of you. Uh, that, that's an astounding statement, and we have to really wrestle with that for a few moments. What I want us to try to grasp with that statement uh, today is that that is true of every night, you see, of every day, of, of every moment. Uh, get in the story and, and roam around a little bit really think through it. You could read it as though the previous night the farmer's soul was not required of him. But that's not how God works, is it? God doesn't work in that way. Life doesn't work in that way. Being in a pandemic should show us uh, just how truly fragile life really is. And so this, uh, so, so God works in this way of saying, your soul could be required of you at any moment. We do not know when that moment may, uh, may arrive, right? And so what is being said from that statement, we don't really speak in that way uh, today. This is a way of saying that he was, he was going to die that night. The farmer was going to die that night. And so you've, you've gained all of this harvest. You've built these barns. You have all of these kind of things, but you're going to die tonight. What good is this? To you now, right? That that's the that's the switch. That's the uh, that's the statement that really makes you pull back and say, "My goodness, what what is what is really being said and, and taught here in this moment?" See, the farmer 
was in need of God at every moment leading up to this moment. Same for us. We are in need of God at every moment leading up to every other moment that we're about to go into. Notice how Jesus frames it. The farmer was speaking to his soul instead of letting God speak to his soul. You see, he was doing all the talking to himself. Uh, and while I'm a big proponent of talking to yourself, at some point you need to stop, right? <laughs> and let God speak to you and listen to God. Because we can talk ourselves into things so quick. And we'll, we'll trust ourselves more than we will trust anybody else. Uh, we're so familiar with our voice. We're so familiar with our way of thinking that it can seem so correct, seem so right. Uh, and when in fact, many times, if we would be honest, we would have to say, well, we're not really sure, or, you know, I've been wrong before. Uh, you know, I've been wrong many times. <laughs> but should I really fully trust in myself? He was talking to his own soul and not letting God speak to his soul. Here's another question to weave into this. Where are we with God? Where are we with God? You can see in the parable, again, it's, it's just a story. It's a, it's a made-up uh, story for a, a specific point. But you can see the farmer was essentially by himself. right? He, he wasn't seemingly with God. Where are we with God? There's another great biblical question given to us in the Psalms. Psalm 121, if you have it, uh, let's, let's read it together. If, uh, if you don't have it, you want to just listen close, that's fine as well. Um, again, I'm reading from the ESV translation. You might have a different translation, that's fine. Just some of the words and phrasing might be a little bit differently. But look at this first question in verse 1 of Psalm 121 and just see how this whole short psalm comes together. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Last week, we looked at Psalm 120, and we said the word with that one was repentance. This week, Psalm 121, and the word is providence. The Lord will provide providence. Provision is what we see here. Where does our help come? Does it come from the hills? Does it come from ourselves? Where is it coming from? And the psalmist taps into this. Our help comes from the Lord. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. I'm reading through uh, this book right now that is a collection of letters between Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his family while he was in prison during World War II. If you're familiar with, uh, with Bonhoeffer, then, then you know the ins and outs of the story. I'm not going to get into the fullness of the story. But uh, Dietrich was imprisoned during World War II by the Nazis, and uh, he was eventually uh, executed. By, by the Nazis. It's interesting to watch or to, to read these letters that go from him being imprisoned to through the years while he was imprisoned. And in so many of the letters, what you find is that they are writing to each other with hope in mind. Uh, there's, we, we hope to see you soon, his parents saying to him. We hope you're going to be released soon. Dietrich saying, I, I hope to be with you again soon. I, I hope that I'm going to be, be released and, and be able to be with you. 
And it's just amazing to, to read through these letters and see these statements again and again and again, month after month after month. But to keep the full fullness of that story in mind of where he never gets released. In fact, at one point he's, he's moved to a different facility. His family had no idea. They, they were not told and they, they couldn't find him. And uh, it, there, there's a, just so much tragic uh, tragedy that's wrapped up in the story. But, but to, to see this, to be reading this hope, knowing you're never, you're never getting out. You're never getting out. You're never going to see him released. And, and just having those thoughts as you're reading these people's just hopes and, and just, just imagining them sitting there at a desk or, or someplace writing this, writing this letter and, and making these truthful statements. We hope to have you home soon. Knowing that was never, never satisfied. Here's a quote from Dietrich. That, uh, that I read this week that I just thought was fantastic. To deviate from the truth for the sake of some prospect of hope of our own can never be wise, however slight that deviation may be. It is not our judgment of the situation which can show us what is wise, but only the truth of the Word of God. Here alone lies the promise of God's faithfulness and help. It will always be true that the wisest course for the disciple is always to abide solely by the Word of God in all simplicity. And I think that that goes so well with Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide providence. From where does our help come? This name of hope for us and this psalm of hope can, um, can be misunderstood. It could be misunderstood if we speak it to our souls instead of letting God speak it to our souls. You see, we can read through that psalm and come to a conclusion, nothing bad is going to happen to me. Everything is going to be fine. If I'm with God, then my life is going to be completely and total, totally easy. I, I should never have a bad moment. That is a lie. That's a lie. And, and if we speak that to our souls, we are deluding ourselves. Even as disciples of God, even following the way of Christ, following after Christ, we will struggle and suffer, right? And this, this is why we have to let God speak his truth into our souls, uh, there's, there's such a long history of this that we can, that we can read and, and know about and, and uh, tap into this. I have, I have stood in a place, I've stood in a tunnel, in a, in a desert, and I have stretched out my arms and located my hands into places where uh, they know that chains were put into the wall and individuals who were Christians, their arms were put into those chains and they were held in that tunnel. And then after a period of time, they were marched out before a crowd and they were martyred. It's, it's a known, this tunnel is known there were specifically, for sure, two women who were known to have been in that tunnel and then taken out and brutally killed. And I've stood there, and it's a moving experience to, to stand in this tunnel and to, to stretch out your arms and to just imagine what it must have been like to be in that dark tunnel hearing the chants, the roar of the crowd for your death. Suffering is no new phenomenon, and it's not going anywhere, right? So what do we do with this psalm? Is it a lie? No, it's not. But this is why we cannot trust ourselves. We have to let God speak to our souls. This psalm is not telling us that we will never struggle. We, we will. The promise 
is preservation from all the evil in them. We will be preserved from all of the evil, and we will not be separated from God if we are with God. That's the beautiful promise here. That while we will still deal with difficulty, it will not ultimately win. You see? Because God indeed is the provider. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Our last text for today, Genesis 22. There's a lot that leads into this story, and so if you're not too familiar with it, or if you haven't read it for a while and so forth, uh, if you could spend some time reading into it later, later on, that that would be really beneficial. I can't I can't recap everything. This is a uh, this is a huge story, uh, really foundational aspect for for scripture, um, but. It's about Abraham, and if you're familiar with that name, you'll know the other name, Abraham and Sarah, right? Abraham and Sarah were without children, and God promised them a son. Long after they should have been having children, uh, it, very miraculous, but then God makes them a promise you will have the son, and then they still have to wait, and they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they get impatient, and they, they speak to their own souls. And they take matters into their own hands and they get ahead of God and they create a huge disaster. Uh, they, they created so much pain and difficulty, not only for themselves, but for, for many others. Uh, and, um, but eventually they are given a son, Isaac. God provided him. He was faithful to his word, and Isaac was born to them, the only son of Abraham and Sarah. Genesis 22, we're going to read a long section here. And, um, and again, there's so much that goes into this, but listen closely, follow along as, as I read through this. Um, remember, this is their only son. The one that they waited for so long, the, the promised son. There's so much hope wrapped into this child. 22, verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and arose, and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here am I, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. 
And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in, and in your offspring shall, be, shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. Stop there at, at that point in the chapter. Now, this is a difficult story. It is a complicated story, and we're only spending a couple of moments on it. Uh, we're not doing it justice at all. It is, it's a story that has been singled out by individuals to do evil things, and it's a story that individuals have used to make claims against God. But when we slow down and we see it in the full arc of Scripture, when we don't just isolate it unto itself, because that's not the intent. We have to look at it in the fullness with Scripture. What we see is beauty and truth begin to emerge. The story is where we find the name of God, Jehovah Jireh, originate. The Lord will provide. Abraham exclaims this after God shows up and says, Do not sacrifice your son. I know now. Uh, and, and in a sense, in a sense, he's saying, You know now, Abraham, where your, royal, your loyalty lies, right? It, it, you, you're different now from how you were before. You're willing to follow me more than yourself. Uh, right and so Abraham says the Lord will provide because the ram was provided for the sacrifice instead of Isaac the Lord did provide and he will provide right again enter this story roam around imagine it imagine what what it was really like do you notice the slow pace of it this wasn't happening very fast. They had to walk miles, many, many miles. Uh, so imagine the slow pace of that walking. And then when Abraham and Isaac get to the top, they have to build an altar. This was made out of stone. So there's gathering of rock. There's gathering of wood. There's, there's such slowness that is through this. Imagine all the conversations that were being had. Imagine all the... All the questions that were being asked. Isaac was asking a lot of questions, right? Uh, I imagine he had a whole lot more questions that he never even voiced, that, that, he, was, that he was thinking in, in his mind. Uh, there's, there's so much that was going on. That I believe this was a, a real event that took place. This is not a parable, uh, right? Even though we can take some things from it and learn from it for ourselves, it was a true story. So imagine what that humanness would be like. Can you, can you smell it? Can you sense it? Can you feel the breeze? Can you, uh, can you sense the struggle as Abraham is picking up these rocks and building this altar, knowing, thinking what is about to come? We don't know what it looks like. We don't know what it, what it was like, but the binding of Isaac, what was said? Was there, was there tears? Was there an attempt at explanations? I don't know. I don't know for sure, but if we squash this down to a flat story of flat words on a flat page, then, then we, lose, we lose that significance of it, you see. In the imagining, it hopefully will become alive for us in a way of where we just imagine the struggle, the difficulty. 
but the obedience and the belief. God will provide. Don't know how, but God will provide. The man in the crowd cried out to Jesus, Help me get my inheritance. If he had, there is a good chance the man would have walked away from Jesus, really happy with the outcome. But he would have been poorer as a result. Abraham, in a sense, cries out, Give me a son. God does it. And Abraham could have walked away from God at that point, happy to have his son, happy to have his heir, happy to look better in the eyes of the people of the culture in which he lived in, because now he has a son. In, in, in that time period and with that culture, that, that was it. That was what you needed. And you didn't have it for so long. You desired a son. Give me a son. He, re he receives that son. He could have walked away from God at that point. He would have been poorer as a result. God sends him to the top of the mountain. Go to the hill. Go to the mountain. Does his help come from the mountain? Remember the question in Psalm 121? From where does our help come? Does it come from the mountaintops? And indeed, it doesn't. See, one of the, one of the things uh, that we can know from the historical record uh, from these ancient times is that a lot of uh, religious practices were done on hilltops, on mountaintops. And so people would go to the tops of the mountains and they would build altars and they would make sacrifices. There were all kinds of um, grotesque practices that were, that were done in these, in these religious Things. And, and I think there's a sense in where God is showing here how different he is. He's not sending, you remember, he knows everything that's going on. He's not, he's not um, doing this spur of the moment or anything. He knows what is taking place. He knows what's going to happen, right? Uh, Abraham didn't. That's, that's the point. But he's showing how different he is from the gods that we create. The gods that we create say, take your firstborn to the top of the mountain and sacrifice them. You will be blessed by the gods. That will awaken the gods because sometimes they fall asleep or sometimes they get a little bit too drunk and you gotta really prod them to get them, to get them awake. Uh, and so sometimes we, we really gotta do some amazing things to, to get them to pay attention to us. Those are the gods we create. That is not Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. He's showing, I am different. I will provide this from myself. Abraham had tried to provide for himself. If you know his story, you know that he tried to do that. And it was a mistake. He was not able to see the reality as God saw it. And that's when we get in trouble. When we speak to our own souls, relying on our own abilities. Have you been watching the Robins this spring? Uh, I love it when the Robins show back up because uh, that means that uh, warmer weather is, is on the way. Although today is cold again. <laughs> uh, but Robins start showing up and Good news, spring is on the way, right? We've, we have uh, these robins that show up in our yard every, every year. Uh, I walk around in our yard a lot. Uh, I spend a lot of time looking at the grass and the flowers and the trees and, and everything. And I gotta be honest, I never see worms. I never see them. And then I watch the robins and they find worms in a place where I just was. And I, I wonder to myself, how do they do that? Right? I was just there, and I didn't see anything that looked delicious for a robin to eat. Right? 
You see, my eyesight and my ability is nowhere near as good in finding worms as, it, as the robins is. Their keen eyesight, and I, I wonder too if maybe their closeness to the ground just enables them to find these things that are there, but in my own abilities, I can't find them. I miss them. How much are we missing because we try to do it through our own ability? Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Part of this language speaks to God seeing. The, the word structure and the, the defining aspects that go in with it uh, point to this, this picture of seeing. And I read this this week and I thought it was really, really helpful. God never simply sees without acting. Wherever God is looking, God is acting. If God perceives, he performs. I find that to be beautiful and hopeful and knowing that we are seen by God. We are known by God. And he acts in our lives. He, he interacts with us. He, he doesn't fall asleep and need prodding from us in order to wake him up. He is the provider. He will provide for us. Some of you might be hearing this and saying, well, that's, that's great and all, but I'm not Abraham, or I'm not a man, or I'm not a father, right? I, I, how can I connect with this story? And I think that we can, through these questions, what is of great importance to you? What is of great importance in your, in your life? Is there something that is extremely precious? Or is there something that you perceive to be missing that you're saying, if I had that, everything would be, uh, would be fine? Are you tempted to take something into your own hands? Are you tempted to try to work out the provision for yourself from yourself? right? And find your full fulfillment in that possession. That's where we can connect with this ancient story, I think. Is, is there some possession of some sort, whatever that could, could possibly be, that if we would get it, the temptation would be to run away from God, feeling fully satisfied, feeling as though we have what, what we need now. You see, this story, uh, it can be used, in a sense, as a template for us, uh, where we don't have to connect with the piece exactly, but we can, we can look at it and we can ask questions and we can connect with it in that way. Here is the larger and more beautiful aspect of this story that moves us now forward and into our very time period. So we started in the New Testament, we moved backward, and now we move forward again. If you're familiar with the story, you know the symbolism here, you know what is going on, that this is a picture of Jesus Christ. This story points us directly to Jesus. And Abraham had no idea about this. He had no idea of what God was fully doing in this moment. And what he's doing is he's laying a foundational groundwork for Jesus. God will sacrifice his one and only son. Jesus, the lamb, will lay down his life willingly. Why? For us. So that we may believe and have life. Life everlasting. If we place our faith and don't run away. See, if we isolate this story and try to use it just for our own purposes, then we can't we can't quickly say, this seems evil. Who would do this? But in keeping it in, in the full arc of the story, 
we see how beautiful it is. We see what God is up to, and we find hope in it. We find hope because it points us directly to Jesus, our Savior, our healer, our sanctifier, our coming King. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. I told you you would hear this name multiple times. How is it landing with you now? What are you thinking of when you hear this name, when you hear this word, provide? Yes, God does indeed provide on a daily life level. Amazingly enough, he does. He will provide for us in our daily life of the, of the little tiny things that you would think that God could easily just overlook and be justified in overlooking it. And he cares about those things. But it's, it doesn't just stay with that. His provision goes beyond that. And we praise him for it. Because our need goes way beyond what we think. We can be just like the, the individual in the crowd. Jesus, tell my brother to share. Friends, our souls are required of us. Who is holding your soul? The worship team is going to start to come up now, and I'm going to close with a poem song by John Newton. You're familiar with Amazing Grace uh, that John Newton wrote. This is another uh, poem song of his, and this is going to be our closing of prayer. So as I read this, I'm going to ask you to take a posture of prayer and just listen to these words. Um, it, it's uh, called, I will trust and be not afraid. Be gone, unbelief. My Savior is near, and for my relief will surely appear. By prayer, let me wrestle, and he will perform. With Christ in the vessel, I smile at the storm. Though dark be my way, since he is my guide, tis mine to obey, tis his to provide. Though cisterns be broken and creatures all fail, the word he hath spoken shall surely prevail. His love in time past forbids me to think he'll leave me at last in trouble to sink. Each sweet Ebenezer I have in review confirms his good pleasure to help me quite through. Determined to save, he watched o'er my path. When Satan's blind slave, I sported with death. And can he have taught me to trust in his name, and thus far have brought me to put me to shame? Why should I complain of want or distress, temptation or pain? He told me no less, the heirs of salvation. I know from his word, through much tribulation, must follow their Lord. How bitter that cup, no heart can conceive, which he drank quite up, that sinners might live. His way, was what, his way was much rougher and darker than mine. Did Christ my Lord suffer, and shall I repine? Since all that I meet shall work for my good, the bitter is sweet, the medicine, food. Though painful at present, twill cease before long, and then, oh, how pleasant, the conqueror's song. Amen. Join us in this last song, please. Thank you.
ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.